everyone and welcome to your NARSA weekly update for the week commencing Monday the 13th of November 2023. It's Gary here again and I actually meant to mention last week that I got the date wrong a couple of weeks ago. I think I said it was November when it was only October and I don't think I acknowledged that last week so I did just want to acknowledge it. I got a a note last night from uh, one of our members here in Calgary, James, who said, by the way, it's uh, it's November, you said, and it's actually October, you know, that sort of thing. So I was going to say you're actually two weeks behind, James, but I didn't bother because that's not my style. But I did want to acknowledge that. That should have been a what Gaz got wrong last week and I didn't include that. Anyway, we're just on the back of yet another successful week for the team with two victories in and two very important games for us, and I know I say important games um, each week, but it, they really are. I mean, obviously, the, the cup games are really important because we want to try and win silverware. The league games are really important as we continue to play catch-up, and the European games are really important to continue for us to, to fly the flag for, for Scotland again, on our own again, and, and obviously for the coefficient points and the various other trappings of success that come from that as well. So that's just a life of a Rangers fan. But anyway, I don't know about you, but I'm I'm kind of lamenting the fact that we're coming up uh, against yet another international break. They seem, uh, they seem maybe like every month these days, don't they? And I don't know. I know we're, we're kind of getting to the final throws of the the qualification for uh, for the Euros for next season, or sorry, next year, I should say. But just when we're hitting stride with solid performances and, of course, more importantly, solid results, it, you know, it, it makes the, watching the team all the more compelling and, quite frankly, all the more enjoyable these days. You know, it, it just, it's a wee bit too bad that we have to take another break. Now, that could be Philippe Clement and his, his team getting a hold of the players who are not away in international journey, an international duty, sorry, and, and you know, getting a chance to properly work with them. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's great to go. It's just a gentle reminder, I guess, for me, of how things were back in our genuine, real heyday when, when we were showing up to support the team fully, fully expecting a performance and a victory every single time, regardless of who we were we were playing at the time and how quickly that feeling can be ripped from our grasp and it, and, it, and then it just seems like a distant memory then it starts to creep back in slowly but surely in the roller coaster of life as a rangers fan isn't it really but you know i have to say i didn't think that that philippe clement would have whipped this squad into shape quite so solidly and quite so quickly um as, as he has and i can't do you know what? I'm going to kind of probably contradict myself a wee bit here, but I can't help but think about what might have been had the board acted a wee bit earlier and dismiss, dismissed Michael Beale after the Old Firm defeat because it wasn't just one Old Firm defeat. That was obviously our second defeat of the season, the domestic season at that particular point, but it was coming on the back of a very, very bland and, and quite worrying um, overall um, post -se sorry, close season or pre-season um, a series of form and games and signings and, and things like that so at the time if we had done that at the time I'm fairly sure I would have thought I would have felt and thought that that might have been just a bit too soon as the club had so obviously backed Michael Beale in the transfer market and it felt right to give him a wee bit of time to, to make something with the squad with the you know, with the knowledge that we thought, I thought at the time that, that he knew what he was doing, he knew how to build a squad and a team and he knew how to get success. But that turned out to be completely untrue, <laughs> of course. And, and we now, it feels like we now have a real manager in there who knows what he's doing. And you can just tell that, can't you? You know, I was saying to a few folks this past week or so, whether it was in the club or just kind of um, at home or whatever it was that, when things become so obvious to you as to as to how things need to be done, then that comes with absolute clarity. And then with clarity comes a greater opportunity to communicate that clarity very clearly to everyone. And I can just tell that that's exactly what's happening. You know, for, for guys like Philippe Clement, he's saying, you know, this is this is how you train. This is how you recover. This is how you prepare for games. This is how you study. This is how you... Um, you know, you look after your body, like this is how you do it. So 
like why would you be doing it any other way so and then when you have that clarity of vision you can then just say you know for example you don't do that this is not the role you play you don't cross the halfway line under these circumstances you don't try and dribble with the ball you don't try and shoot when there's no shot or, like whatever it is he seems to have just provided the most absolute clarity of the basics for each and every single player who's on the field there and some of the players uh, which I'll probably get to in just a wee bit here are starting to really really thrive from that some of the ones that were causing a lot of concern and, and worry when, when Michael Beal was in charge as well so it's great to see from a obviously from a fan perspective but from a, from a leadership perspective as well it's just great to have that his press conferences are entertaining and informative and um, the way that he delivers the message he doesn't waffle his words I was quite enamored with Michael Beale in the beginning because he was so chatty and shared a bunch of information but as it turns out for for the most part he was just kind of flapping his face a wee bit and it became you know just nonsense to, to listen to what he was saying time after time Philippe come on you know, the, the, the pre-match press conferences and the post-match press conferences are an education and they're very entertaining as well. So long may that continue. Anyway, let's go on to the game segment for this week. Our first game, of course, was Thursday's against the same team second game of two halves <laughs> and the 2-1 win against uh, Sparta Prague in which was, our, of course, our fourth game in the Europa League and this result really sets us up for success leading into the last couple of games in terms of qualification for the knockout stages of the, the, the competition. All we need to do now is beat Aris Limassol and Ibrox here in, in a couple of weeks and that's us qualified uh, before we even head to Seville to play Real Betis in the final game um, which is of course just before the League Cup final as well. One good thing about that is if we had to go to Betis and get a result there and put in a monumental effort which might be in some way um, incapacitating for the Sunday League Cup final the good thing is Aberdeen are also playing on that Thursday night as well and although they're out of Europe and um, already confirmed to be out of Europe in the Conference League the fact that they have a game that time it doesn't give them a week to recover while we're still playing a very important game so just those little little nuances of things that, that can add up um, to, to something uh, potentially significant but the big games for us, as I kind of alluded to a little bit earlier, they are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger with each passing week and month, it feels like. And, and you know, more about these games, of course, when we get closer to the games. But um, on, on this particular game, we started the game like an absolute house on fire. We're 2-0 up, going on 4-0 within 20 minutes. Uh, of, of the game is their defence just seemed to completely crumble <laughs> didn't it? it was brilliant and and they were making mistake after mistake after mistake which was absolutely incredible to see but we worked to make that happen and and the great thing about our team now is that we're very very hungry to score and, and are getting relentless uh, that relentless feel about us again like we had in the in the 55 season and we capitalised early on this occasion with goals from Danilo and a, and a brilliant team move absolutely superbly finished off by a ever returning to form Todd Cantwell he's getting back now isn't he and we just kept going and going and it really could and should have been more I'm going to talk about that a wee bit um, when we talk about Sunday's game there and had it not been for some goalkeeper heroics and and uh, the 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 uprights we would have we would have definitely made this this would have been out of sight by half time and it kind of should have been to be honest and I honestly thought we'd get a wee bit more of the same in the second half but the second half was a bit more a bit more tepid not the same intensity or excitement and then we lost a goal in the seventy seventh minute to give us a bit of a nervy end but apart from the obligatory brilliant save from Jack Butland there wasn't really too much to get as you know, very, very nervous or have us completely panicking towards the end of the game. And on reflection and looking at the highlights back, we honestly weren't really in any danger of losing um, any of the three points um, that, that we had deserved or we had earned. And we saw the game out uh, relatively simply. And, and again, back to what I was saying, you know, a couple of months ago, that would have given us heart palpitations. We would have ended the game absolutely emotionally spent and exhausted because the team, we knew that we had a late equaliser um, or a late winner even um, to lose a late equaliser or winner, I mean, um, in us. We, we knew the team had capitulation throughout um, the entire squad. Um, but this squad is different now. Same team, uh, same, same members of the squad, I should say, but... You know we've got uh, we've got some steel about us now. We know that the game management, and we can uh, we can do that fairly well. 
we might have wanted to manage taking the ball into the corner a wee bit better because we did that three times in the last couple of minutes. <laughs> it just lost it every single time. And I'm like, what are you doing? But other than that, it was um, it was fairly comfortable. Positives, the result in the first half performance, uh, I thought we were absolutely brilliant in the first half in particular. And now we're really, really well set up for qualification and football after Christmas, which is... Um, a bit of you know a bit of a welcome relief after our European disappointments from last season, and looking at other European results for the the remaining Scottish teams, there were once again flying the flag for for Scottish teams in, in European competition, and that's just the way that it always seems to work out, isn't it? Uh, negatives at the time of the second half, like watching it real time and live, it, it seemed like we, we took our foot off the gas, but when you listen to the manager after the game, he did acknowledge that the first half was exactly what he wanted in terms of effort and application and that the target is to have that effort and application throughout the entire 90 minutes, but with this stage and state of the squad, that just isn't possible right now, and that seems like another another damning verdict from him. Um, he's, he hasn't been uh, overly veiled in his criticism of, of the condition of the players, um, but it's a wee bit of a damning verdict of the previous management regime and what they did or didn't do with the fitness and conditioning of, of the squad. And while I get it, and, and I do acknowledge that, and you can see a discernible change in fitness and attitude level and energy and application and all the things that I've talked about already, I do think there is a little bit too much of a propensity to completely lay the blame at Michael Beale's door for that. These guys are professionals, professional football players. They've been doing it their entire life. They have been playing at a very high level. They've been coached by other coaches who know what they're doing. And they know, they should know how to look after their bodies and look after their own conditioning and look after their own strength and such. And I don't understand when we get to a spot where they don't that what they're what they're actually doing about that you know so it's not it's not just all him and when I say him of course I'm I'm talking about Michael Beale there so just to, not not to give him a complete reprieve or anything like that but just to acknowledge that you know it's not uh, the players have to take some responsibility and of course it's the same players that got Michael Beale the sack in conjunction with. Michael Beal, of course. Anyway, in terms of possession, it said, interestingly enough, that we had 41% possession, which I thought felt like we had more than that. Um, but the, the kicker here is that we had um, a total of 15 shots with eight on target um, versus uh, they, they had seven shots in total and three on target as well. I don't actually recall all three of those, but uh, certainly the Jack Butlin save one was at the end. So 41% possession. I guess maybe that was part of the plan to give up um, the lion's share of possession just to make sure that we kept things tight and compact. Something like that. So anyway, the referee watch. I thought the referee did okay, I felt that we were really unlucky not to have our third goal immediately after they had scored their first, after Danilo was penalised for the foul. He wasn't even looking at the ball, or he wasn't even looking at their player or anything like that. Now, I can see why the referee gave it, and maybe I'd be shouting for it if it was the, the other way, but I felt kind of hard done to uh, for this one. So for that, he's not going to get the regular 7 out of 10. He's going to get 6.5 out of 10 for that I think but yeah great result great performance and very very happy with that as we move forward second game was Sunday's 2-0 away win at Livingston with goals from Cyril Dessers and a penalty from James Tavernier after uh, Tavernier had, had missed a penalty earlier in the game like he also did against Hearts uh, a few games ago as I've mentioned before with Livingston you've probably fed up hearing me say this I never truly enjoy the, the games at Livingston. I think they're always frantic and kind of turgid and, and not very, very entertaining. This one was a wee bit different just in terms of, of the fact of how we control the game. I thought, I mentioned last week on the on the kind of pre, or the, the preview, sorry, of of the game that Livingston have been on a bit of a of a downer, of a streak right now. And that's ultimately how it, it turned out to be for them because um, they're not, um, they're not in a, in a good space or place at all I think still still second bottom of the league and we controlled the game we, we really did we uh, we did really really well in the game overall and these are the games that are going to continue to amass us the points to get us to a point where hopefully we're challenging for the league title come the, the business end of the season but positives the result in a clean sheet 
at a place where we have struggled before, but we're exercising those demons slowly but surely as we as we go through. Tom Lawrence and Ross McCausland, uh, Ross McCausland getting a start as well. And also not starting with Sam Lammers. It was, was, I don't know what the rationale or reasoning behind that was, but that just kind of shows that, that the manager doesn't have a blind spot for him it's kind of like you know the Bert Cornerman rule where he automatically gets a game doesn't matter how he plays each week um, so that that was a, that was interesting and Cyril Dessers as I mentioned they're getting on the score sheet you know with a bit of a fortuitous effort um, but he was there to, to do it after a brilliant ball from, from Tom Lawrence um, it has to be said and, and getting to a spot where um, you know he's he's he has the ability to get a shot away and it, it, of course it kind of trundles over the line we just weren't in any danger of losing that game and and honestly could and should have have been more a very very competent performance for us but and this is what I was alluding to a wee bit earlier when you see yet another Aberdeen capitulation against the, the East End mob and that sees them stretch the goal difference lead at the top we were we were a goal ahead of them a, a couple of games ago it feels like and now we're like six or seven behind something like that and I'm sure I'm sure Philippe and his, his team will be aware of that and, and will want us, or they will want our chance conversion numbers to be better than what they are right now and make the goal difference less um, of a thing. And I don't mean to suggest that we cast too many looks across the city, but we just need to make sure that we are we're keeping loose tabs on them and then, and then figure it out. Because that capitulation at the end, what was it, like three goals they lost in the last three minutes or something like that? It's just pathetic. It's what Aberdeen do. We we know that. And if you if anybody had seen Chris Boyd's um, post match interview or post match rant, I guess you could probably say it was, where he said it was embarrassing. The players gave up. This is what they do all the time. The good thing for Barry Robs and the Aberdeen manager is he doesn't have to worry about the next game because the team will be bang up for it because it's against Rangers. I mean, it's so palpably obvious. And it just seems like the entire club of Aberdeen don't care. They don't care what happens against Celtic. They really, really care about what happens against Rangers. And it's just pathetic. And it's typical. It's just the way that they do things. But if you didn't get a chance to see it, and you know, just go to YouTube and um, check out <clears throat> excuse me, the Chris Boyd post-match thing and, and see he's not a happy chappy at all. Uh, anyway, negatives from the game. I thought uh, Goldson's goal being chopped off for offside and McCausland's brilliant finish and uh, being uh, chopped off for for a foul in the box I thought those were kind of kind of harsh uh, to, to be very honest the, the offside one I could see that that was a bit more clear cut but the McCausland one even the player who went down wasn't even I think Tom Miller talked about this on commentary the player who went down wasn't even calling for a foul it was just a coming together of players which was Danilo's third goal against Sparta as well but we didn't get away with that one unfortunately and Tav hitting the woodwork with, with another penalty that would have kind of changed the, the, the first half um, dynamic for us if he had to put that one away other than that no negatives at all. It was another really solid performance. In terms of the stats, we had 68% possession. We had 14 shots uh, on goal with six on target. To the are three shots on goal with one on target as well. So the stats kind of you know reflect the, how, how we feel about it as well. On the referee watch, Stephen McLean did did what he had to do. He was kept pretty busy with the, the various VAR calls and, and did as much as he could to kind of keep the play flowing. And I thought, I thought initially, I have to say, towards the end of the game, he was succumbing to the, well, you have to book Todd Cantwell narrative. But when I did see the replay of that particular foul, that one did merit a yellow. So credit to him for actually seeing it for, for what it was. So I'm going to give him a 7 out of 10. Nothing spectacular. Did his job. Kept out the way. Didn't really have an overlay. Um, overbearing influence on the game or anything like that. So in terms of next games, after quite a hectic period of games, of course, we have no games this week due to the international break that I mentioned earlier. And in fact, we have no games until we're away to Aberdeen that I just mentioned there on the 26th. That's another very early kickoff. Um, so that feels like ages away right now from 13th to the 26th. So we've got just, just under um, two weeks to wait for that one. For RTV, nothing um, explicit to talk about from an RTV perspective. We are uh, we are working on getting the first incremental payment. I'm not sure if I mentioned that last week or not uh, to RTV. Hopefully going to make that wire transfer, transfer this coming Saturday and then we'll get a chance to get around the table with RTV at some point here over the next wee while. Shoutouts. Uh, I've got a couple of shoutouts. Uh, the, the first one 
is a get well message for London Rangers Supporters Club member Nikki Lyle, who is in the hospital. Uh, very gratefully and thankfully, Dave Schillinglaw from the London RSC had created a WhatsApp group with some, some key contacts just to basically keep everyone up to date with that. I believe Nikki is also on, on that, so he gets a chance to kind of um, have a wee look at the goodwill and, and get well messages that are coming in as well. He's, he's had a bit of a turn. He's, he's got a wee bit of a, a road to recovery ahead of him. He's He was in the, the hospital. I think he was in the ICU for a wee while and then he got transferred to a ward and the ward is unfortunately locked down through a, a COVID outbreak as well. So nobody's really had a chance to get to see him. But for those who know Nicky, he's a avid attender at uh, NASA conventions. We had a, actually had a great laugh uh, back in Toronto in June at the convention. He came in with this cracking, cracking case of of his as um you know a suitcase and it was a Rangers it was a Rangers badge suitcase it was a, it was an absolute beauty you would get away with that here imagine the mess of that if you were trying to use that back home <laughs> with all these um not Rangers friendly baggage handlers at the airports and such but um yeah I hope he's I hope I hope I hope you're doing well Nikki and I hope you you keep the spirits up we'll keep the messages going for you my friend and wishing you an absolutely speedy recovery from everyone here at NARSA. And friend of NARSA, Alan Frew of Glass Tiger fame, and of course he was our headline act at the Brahma Lee convention in 2014. He is doing a gig at the the Opera House in Toronto on Saturday the 17th of February 2024, which is incidentally my sister Debbie's birthday. And he's been asking for a bit of support to do that. I believe, I believe the theme of the show is going to be 80s and 90s and he's kind of advertising it as a simply the best um, show and he's looking to he's getting asked if if this could possibly turn into a tour but he can't turn it into a tour if the first concert doesn't go as well as possible I assume the promoters and advertisers and financial supporters of that would wouldn't be overly interested if he can't kind of back it up as to being a, a general money maker as well so I'll find the link to that if I can and put it in the blurb for today. If I can't find the link, just YouTube Alan through the Opera House, February 24. You'll see it. You'll get an opportunity um, to buy some tickets. Go along and see him. I've seen Alan a number of times over the years and he's he's fantastic value for money and always gives it uh, loudly when it comes to the Rangers stuff as well. So yeah, it'd be great to see if we could support that as well and just on the rangers website a bit earlier today i had read that uh, the details for mary tiny gallica were published on the website and it says tiny who served the club for over 50 years was a treasured friend to generations of players and staff receiving the john Gregg achievement award in 2014 for her dedication to the club a private service will take place at 12 noon on tuesday the 14th of november with the funeral cortege set to pass Ibrooks prior to this, so prior to the noontime. Um, supporters are invited to pay their final respects and also on the Rangers website there is a video and it's about maybe 24, 25 minutes, uh, something like that and it just it's all about um, Tiny as well. I didn't ever get the opportunity to meet her unfortunately in the times that I was over at the club but what what an absolute server, what an absolute legend as well. So if you can get along there tomorrow morning, it would be it would be appreciated by the friends and family, I'm sure. If you can't, there is a there is a, a video there that you can get a chance to to take a peek at on the Rangers website as well. From a convention update perspective, nothing too too much to report other than what I said uh, last week. We do have the the Gaylord Palms and the Omni Resort initial proposals in place. We are trying to get around the table with Rangers to, to walk and talk through what the next steps would be to getting towards you know contract um, offers being on the table. It's basically just a couple of PowerPoint presentations that we have right now. And then we'll get a chance to see where we're going from there. We do need to speak to Rangers first because they are a, obviously a, a key partner in this um, before we go forward. So hopefully using the international break as a wee bit of a breather to be able to get that progressed and, and move on with that. I have to say, I was speaking with Graham from Five Stars earlier today we're just having a bit of a catch up and, and I said that we've been in that the NASA executives specifically have been in a little bit of a a little bit of a funk, a little bit of a, a lull ever since we, we made the difficult decision to 
uh, to cancel New York 2024 and it feels a wee bit surreal it doesn't feel like personally it doesn't feel like I'm serving the membership um, like I normally am so I'm going to be using some of this extra time that I've carved out for myself with my career change to catch up on my emails create a proper strategy for the next you know 18 months or so as we ease into um, the next cycle of elections and stuff like that for 2025 but more importantly to get the conventions back on the roadmap that's what keeps us ticking over I've never known a time other than during Covid when we, we didn't have a convention to organise and I'm starting to kind of miss it a little bit as well so you'll hear a wee bit more active information as we go forward from there as well. On communications for this week on the JERS guide today there is information about the away days um, that's on, that you probably find it on YouTube and it's certainly on the Rangers TV website and there's also for, for the women's team as well there's also Inside Broadwood which chronicles the, the game against uh, Borough Your Thistle which Rangers ran out 7-0 Winners in the, the Sky Challenge Cup there, so we're back into the semi-finals of that tournament as well. Congratulations to all the women. Uh, tomorrow there's going to be on the Rangers website a loan review. I talked about the loan reviews there a couple of shows ago. Um, just It's just fascinating to keep to keep tabs on who's doing what and how things are going elsewhere and things like that. So always a good read. On Wednesday there's an international preview. Nothing specific slated for Thursday. And on Friday, there's a big press conference um, regarding the game uh, between Rangers and Glasgow City, which is this coming Saturday. Um, so that, that's going to be, that's a big one, of course, the games against Celtic and Glasgow City. Glasgow City haven't had a, um, haven't had a great season thus far, so they'll be looking to claw some points back, I'm sure. There's also going to be information over Rangers social media channels um, regarding celebrating Brogan Hay and Nicola Doherty, who have recently celebrated 100 appearances for the, the women's team as well. And a really interesting piece on goalkeeping generations and this this particular part of, of the show on Rangers TV chronicles Peter McCloy and Mason Munn as well. So really going to look forward to keeping an eye out for that and seeing what that sort of stuff is. Peter McCloy was absolutely gold dust for us in Vegas last year. Just could not do enough for everyone when he was there. And when he walked in with the replica of the of the Cup Winners' Cup from 1972, the place erupted. It was fantastic. And then on Saturday is the, the Glasgow City versus Rangers game, and that's in the Scottish Power Women's Premier League at Peters Hill Park with a 2.10pm kickoff. Nothing slated for Sunday on the Jers Guide. We do still have the two two tickets for the Heart and Hand live show uh, that's coming up on, the Decem on December the 1st. I keep saying it every week. We're, we'll get it out there. I promise we will. I'll talk to the communications folks this week. If you didn't get a chance to see either on the Rangers website or on Rangers social media channels the drone tour that they did, which is a, a one take drone tour that takes you from kind of basically outside Ibrox along the street and then it goes in through the stadium, through the museum, through Edmiston House, back to the stadium. It's absolutely out of this world. It's about six minutes long. I, I typically, that's too long for me, <laughs> he says, entering the 28th minute of the, the pod this week. But once I sat down and actually watched it in entirety, absolutely incredible to see you know how beautiful our stadium is how incredible the, the facilities and amenities on the stadium campus are and things like that makes me very proud to be a rangers fan whoever dreamed that up and then executed is absolutely amazing congratulations and well done you should check that out i definitely will put a link to the, the blurb on that um, for this week's article for this week's blurb on the on the pod for this week's pod I mean and then uh, what I was hoping to do this week I didn't get a chance to do it yet was just to get some information from the the fans forum that was held last week at Edmiston House just to get some details on that I assume they're going through the notes the notes will eventually be published I heard some bits and pieces um, around you know what Clement was saying about the condition of the players that we did have a key player out which turned out to be Scott Scott Wright for the European game last week he was leaving to go and see the B team I believe. Um, but by all accounts, it was a good it was a good session. I don't want to give you any kind of rumor or innuendo about what was or wasn't covered that day. So I'll just wait till the notes come out and then just give you a wee bit of a summary. Hopefully that will be next week or the week after something like that. And just as earlier today, we we did see that the the annual report was published in in advance of the annual general meeting, which is going to be held on the 5th of December. And some of the key highlights that are listed as the club reported uh, another set of, of healthy, robust financials to build on 
uh, previous years. It was our second consecutive year of operating profit. Our overall, overall revenue is above 80 million annually and we had record commercial revenue, positive player trading performance, um, which is a fundamental um, pillar to the club's business model and continued investment in the facilities and the team, which uh, will again uh, be continuing going forward. And speaking about the, the annual report, John Bennett, our chairman, had said the club has, for the second year in succession, returned an operating profit turnover for the year to 30th of June 2023 was 83.8 million generating an operating profit of 252,000 pounds and while successive years of operating profitability can be seen as encouraging especially in light of what had gone on before there is still much work to be to be done the club vision must be simple and clear sustainable success this applies both on and off the pitch and it must be a mantra by which all at the club live. Football is a business which is particularly prone to being reactive and while this may be inherent in the industry, sustainable success can only come when we are assist we are systematic in our processes and in our actions. It's my firm conviction that this is a precursor to returning the club to the status of serial winners. I have talked previously of the four components of financial sustainability, season ticket sales, commercial revenue, European football and player trading. And while the first of these components will never be taken for granted, it's the fourth that requires the attention. Player trading will always be inherently volatile, yet Rangers must replace sporadic wins with systematic success. It's a given that it all begins with player recruitment. This is an area of priority for your board and we anticipate that the, com the coming months will see a strengthening in the leadership and processes of our football department, specifically with this in mind. So they're, they're talking there, of course, about the, the director of football or sporting director, whatever he's likely to be called. Probably also maybe confirming one of the first team coaches as well. You, you remember that when Philippe Clement came in, he says he would give it a number of weeks to, to just try and discern what he needed from from that as we go forward. And the, the main thing is sustainable, sustainability, like having the basics in place and continuing to sustain and, you know, ongoing operations ongoing profitability um, and, and ongoing um, you know communication and dialogue with the, with the key stakeholders at the club including the fans as well so yeah really good quite exciting to see and the the AGM only being just what's that about three weeks away now that'll be interesting to see how that all goes as well okay okay that will do it for this week my friends as always I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you very 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 much for taking the time to listen and please do share it with someone that you think might enjoy it. Until next week, I think, you know, we're, we're just in a situation where we get an opportunity. We have earned the right for a bit of a rest. We can see how the internationals uh, pan out for the various players that are involved in those, the various Rangers players that are involved in those as we go forward. And then we'll get an opportunity to be back and look forward to our next game against Aberdeen as we close in on the League Cup final. So until next week, please do take care of yourselves and all the very best to you, okay? Cheerio now.